Um, okay, on to VOF and multi-phase flows. So let's um, see what we've got here. Um, so there are two VOF formulations, implicit and explicit. So implicit is where we're solving the equations implicitly and iterating at each step. Um, and this is generally faster to solve because you can take much bigger time steps. But poor convergence leads you to having um, spurious regions of one phase in the other. So uh, here's a, a gear pump. So imagine that that's spinning round uh, and it's, it's immersed in oil and, and you've got a gas above, oil below. Um, all of a sudden, you've got all these spurious little knobs of air building up here that are not there because of any physical effect. They're there because of bad numerics. Um, so there's been improvements to this formulation that gets rid of those. And, and of course, a um, byproduct, or if you think about it, the reason for it not being there, whichever way you think of it, is that you get better looking convergence. So particularly for continuity. So um, that's a significant improvement. Now, on the explicit formulation, you're actually jumping forward in time explicitly. So you take your conditions at now and you step forward. And if you step forward with a small enough time step, that's stable and that, that's probably current number limited to less than one or fraction of one. Um, but there's certain cases that don't work very well of those. And um, those um, can be um, a bit of a, a problem. So what you can do now is actually not solve the volume fraction at the start, but at the end. So you can solve other equations first and then solve the volume fraction. And when you've got things like changing boundary conditions um, in, in a setup, this is actually better. It's got a few um, restrictions, but um, it's, it's a first pass at allowing you to do this. So it's a two way only option. But this is something that's looking really promising. And certainly for some microfluidics applications and that where you might be having changing flow rates and things and conditions, this would be a good thing to give a try. So there's a couple of things on boundary conditions here. Um, and um, th this is one that dates back forever. When I was doing Taylor flow bubble work uh, 10 years ago, we had to write a UDF always to stop your droplet when it gets to the end bouncing back and, and going crazy. And the reason is you need to be able to tell the code that um, use the species, et cetera, or the, or the phase that's heading towards the boundary. And you can do that by from neighboring cell. And in this case, as you can see in this bottom one, as, as this droplet approaches the boundary, out it goes. And that's a region where you've actually got a continuous input. Whereas here, these continuous inputs are just bouncing around in an unphysical way. Secondly, this comes in when you've got a rotating flow because you need a, a proper boundary condition then that can deal with that, that, that uh, rotating component there. And this has now been improved. This is quite a specific one, but for those of you who use user-defined uh, scalars or lots of species transport and things, then there were some residual issues with things not being perfect across parallel interfaces. And this has now been um, fixed up. If you're into, into using the detailed boiling model, so the RPI model, where you're actually going to model all of the, like the bubble formation from, from a nucleation site and growth and departure, there's a big problem with mesh independence. 
because as you make your mesh finer and finer, it goes from being in the log law into the laminar layer. And your correlations that you need for exterior conditions really want stuff that's out in the uh, log layer. So what you can do now is to put in um, lines that go out from the wall and sample and determine what the Y plus would be at various points and sample like the temperature there that's needed so that you bring back the effective subcooling in the boundary layer, not something that changes every time you uh, refine the mesh. So um, this is quite a significant development and makes that, uh, that model much more robust and, and less uh, mesh, mesh dependent. Okay, so moving on to the related area of the discrete particle model and wall films. Um, these go together quite naturally because they interact so strongly. So um, one, one thing that users of this will like is that there's a new type of injection, which is tabular. So if you've got experimental data of frequencies or cumulative distribution against size, you can read a text file into Fluent. You can tell it whether it's accumulated or it's a, or it's a probability density. You can choose whether it's based on number or whatever. And you can then just get this into your calculation without having to fit anything to it. There's been some speed ups here, so um, and and cleaning up. So one is really around input output. So surprisingly, it took a very long time to display the uh, particle injection markers and that on Linux, like up to forty odd seconds for for a group of them here, which has now been reduced to three. So it just improves your your uh, GUI waiting time there. There's been some export improvements for Ensight and just general export as well. Um, if you want to take the data outside of Fluent. And then some really key ones here. So there's been um, big improvements in performance when um, certain certain conditions. So Previously, um, the way data was moved around in that, you used to have to lock and unlock threads uh, at, at boundaries of, of domains, uh, of, of partitions. So they found ways around that, and that's given us some good speed ups here um, with you know 15% typically across the board for um, cases uh, you know, on 32 up to 1,000 cores. Secondly, when you've got a lot of chemistry in that going on, you know that particles need the chemistry data. Um, so they might need the species if, if they're, but the species might have to be calculated, say, from a uh, flame library. So each time you want a species value in a cell, you have to call the flame library and revert it back. Um, now, if you can, if you free populate some mem memory, with actually the um, combustion species uh, distribution in that cell, then any particle that passes into that cell has it immediately there in memory. And you can see that particularly on larger setups, this is giving another, you know, even 20% improvement. So these are significant. Um, there's um, also some other improvements that have been found to be really good for gas turbines. Um, and all of this is feeding into um, improved behavior, improved behavior when you've got particles interacting with multi-phase, with um, steep gradients in a cell, or with Lagrangian wall film particles. So um, significant improvements there. When, um, when droplets um, inter have, have interact with a wall, um, 
what how they behave depends on the wall temperature you know whether you're getting rebound or flash evaporation or whatever um, and that also depends on the part of the velocity or Weber number. Um, there's, there's a new model there which allows to have a bit of a transition zone rather than a, than a switch between spread and, and flash evaporation or splash and evaporation. So it gives you a more realistic model that you can use in, in such systems. For the Ornarian wall film, um, you've now got uh, more control over having um, the time marching. So you can do more steps per, per particle iteration and you can control that time step behavior. So um, that again is giving us, us more flexibility in, in the wall film solver. 